You know, friends, as we uh, think about the time in which we live, I want to ask you a question tonight. When somebody comes up to you and uh, greets you, coming to church or maybe down shopping, wherever the case may be, and somebody says, how are you doing? How are you? How do you respond? How do you respond? Somebody says, how are you doing? How do you respond? We usually say, oh, fine, great, good, wonderful, whatever the case may be. But I'd like to suggest a different way to respond to that. As Seventh-day Adventists, I would like to suggest that we should respond to that question, how are you, with a strong affirmation, I'm full of hope. I'm full of hope. Now, you may think that I'm doing that simply because I represent Hope Channel, but I'm not. Uh, he says, am I sure? <laughs> well, you know, the Hope Channel is named for the very core reason why we exist as a people. It's the hope of Jesus' second coming. Amen. Do you have hope in your heart tonight? Amen. Now, I hope you're watching Hope Channel. Don't misunderstand me. But the hope that is found in the Bible, the hope that is in Jesus, is far greater than any te TV technology, let me tell you. And I'm so glad tonight that I have hope. When I hear of the disasters like what's happened here in Moore, Oklahoma, and you see the shootings up in Massachusetts, and we can go down the long list of disasters that are happening around the world. Friends, if I didn't have hope, wow, what a terrible world it would be to live in. Can't you agree? When I see those things happening, I say, thank you, Jesus, that I have hope. When I stood at the graveside of my mother, and most recently my father, died at age 92, I'm glad I have hope. Amen. I'm glad I have hope. When I stand at the bedside of somebody who is sick as can be, cancer, maybe advanced diabetes, or whatever the case may be, I'm glad I have hope. Amen. I'm glad that I have hope, friends. Because if it wasn't for that, we would be the most despairing people that we could ever imagine. So I'd like to encourage you. When somebody says, how are you doing? Don't tell them about any aches or pains or anything like that. Don't just simply say, oh, I'm fine. But say to them, I'm full of hope. And I'll tell you, you'll find that people will stop. And they'll look at you and say, what do you mean? Why do you say that? And it's a wonderful way to be able to witness. So uh, turn to the person next to you. Ed, yes. I'm full of hope. <laughs> Good. I am too. <laughs> Good. Do it right now, would you? Turn to the person next to you and say, I'm full of hope. We can be people of optimism and joy tonight because Jesus has given us hope. This week, in fact, yesterday, was a very, very special day. Do you know it was a birthday yesterday? Do you know whose birthday it was? Anybody have a guess, an idea? You're right. It's the birthday of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Do you know how many years it is? 150 years. Yesterday was the 150th anniversary of when a group of individuals got together in Battle Creek, Michigan, in a little tiny church building, and they discussed for a couple of days the ways in which God's work could be advanced. And finally, those individuals, a small little group, I'm going to show you a few pictures of them in a minute, but we're going to, that group of individuals had a mission and a vision for the future. And I don't have a, ta a cake here tonight, and uh, I'm not suggesting, Pastor, that you should get a great big flat sheet cake here that would feed, feed a couple thousand people on Sabbath to commemorate that. But you know, friends, tonight I want to think with you a little bit of what God has done for his people in these 150 years. If there's ever a text that encapsulates the hope that we have in Jesus and the reason that we exist as a people, it's John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And if you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to that passage. You probably know it by heart, and if you don't, I encourage you to learn it. John 14, 1 to 3. 
As Jesus was there with his disciples meeting with them, just before he went to his crucifixion, he said to them, let not your hearts be troubled. Let's say it together. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I will come again. It is the promise of Jesus' second coming that is the reason we are called Adventists. Adventists. And friends, 150 years ago, the circumstances of our world and of our church were dramatically different from what they are tonight. Dramatically different. For a few moments, I want to contrast and, and think back with you to what hap was happening 150 years ago and what's happening in the world tonight. Adventism was born in the great second advent or the second great revival in American history. William Miller, you know the story, was a Baptist preacher. He was an individual who had converted from, at best, deism, possibly atheism. He had taken the Bible and had sat down there in his little farmhouse uh, and had studied the Bible and had come to the realization that there was a Savior and that the Bible could be understood and it had a message for him today. In our world today, there are a lot of people who believe in atheism or in postmodernism or they believe in existentialism, rationalism, a lot of different beliefs that may not, are not identical to deism but have the same bottom line effect. They produce no hope. And in William Miller's experience, he discovered hope in the Bible, and he discovered Jesus Christ. And Jesus became a precious, precious Savior to him. Now, William Miller is known as the individual who started the Advent Awakening, the Second Advent Awakening. And, of course, we know that that culminated in 1844. We think of him as a prophetic preacher, and I want to in a few moments, show you some of the experiences surrounding the birth of the church with William Miller. But did you know, do you really appreciate the fact that William Miller was a gospel preacher? He was a preacher who attracted a huge following among the Baptist, Methodist, all of the different denominations of the day as a revivalist because he led people to the foot of the cross and to accept Jesus Christ. Now the premise from which he began, and he was a very nondescript individual who kind of walked with a limp, a little bit heavy set, his passion was the second coming of Jesus Christ and the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And he started his revivals in Daniel and in Revelation, but he led people to the Gospels. In the Adventist Research Society, we have William Miller's Bible. William Miller's Bible. Now, for those of you who use your Bible regularly, and I hope that's every person here, you will notice that there's a little bit of oil on your fingers that even though you have your hands as clean as possible, gradually the pages that you use the most and refer to the most become marked and slightly soiled by the oil that comes from the fingers. In my Bible, I love studying the book of Ephesians. It's heavily marked, and there's a little bit of oil on the pages. I have several Bibles that I preach from, and I have other Bibles that are heavily marked in the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation when I'm preaching evangelistically. I read the chapter in the book of Proverbs that corresponds with the day of the month. And I make notes in those pages, and so the book of Proverbs is heavily marked. But in William Miller's Bible, the pages that are the darkest, the pages that are soiled the most are the four Gospels. 
prima facie evidence that the focus of William Miller was not the Antichrist. It was not the four kingdoms and all of the other things that we find in prophecy. It was the Christ of prophecy, Jesus Christ, the very center. And our movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement, was born in a revival of leading men and women to Jesus Christ so that when Jesus Christ came down through the skies of heaven, they would be ready to meet him. It wasn't a fear-driven or favor-driven evangelism. It was love-driven evangelism. Amen. You take James White. He was a pastor in the Christian Connection Church. And a number of these other individuals, closely connected, Methodist, Christian Connection, all of these individuals, they were Christians. They were Bible-believing Christians, Christ-centered Christians. And you know, friends, they loved Jesus with all of their heart. And Adventism was born in that prophetic, Christ-centered experience of evangelism. Now, they had the focus of the second coming correct. They had the prophecies computed correctly, but they had a misunderstanding about what happened at the end of the prophecy. They believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the cleansing of the earth by fire. They lived in their era, and at that time it was believed that the millennium would be something that would happen gradually on the earth. And there would be a thousand years of development. It was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and there was huge developments taking place. The world was growing, getting better and better. That was the common belief interpreted by the churches of the day. But William Miller was teaching a message that was diametrically different to that. He was teaching that Jesus was going to come and put an end to the world as we know it. And he understood that to be the flames and the destruction of the second coming. Well, he got that wrong. And for those of us who are acquainted with the story, we call it the great disappointment. And in one sense, that is true. But the reality of Jesus as our Savior, the revival that occurred with that, the prophecies, the second coming, were true. And there the group of disappointed believers began to say, why? What's happened? And in that milieu, in that experience, they turned back to the Word of God and they discovered an understanding of the heavenly sanctuary and the ministry of Jesus Christ that is occurring and the judgment that began in 1844 in the heavenly sanctuary. They understood that and joy began to fill their hearts and they were impelled to go out. And at the same time, there was the message of the advent advent the second coming there was the message also of the sabbath we owe to the seventh day baptists the belief and the understanding of the bible sabbath and in that little church in washington new hampshire they began to keep the seventh day sabbath joseph bates a very interesting person if you want an interesting read go down here to the bookstore to the abc and get the biographical story on the uh uh, on, on the life of Joseph Bates. He was one hard-bitten character that got softened up by the gospel. And he came to love Jesus Christ. And the story is that he went from that, that understanding of the Sabbath, and there were times in the winters in the 50s, in the 1850s, where he walked literally through the snow. It says he waded through the snow. Now, I come from British Columbia, Canada, and we don't have much snow in my part of Canada, but there are other parts of Canada where there's an awful lot of snow. And you take the northern states, Pennsylvania, New York, this is where he was, he was hiking and trudging, and he walked for days through snow that was up through uh, just below his, his waist, trudging to find families that believed in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And there he shared with them the news of the sanctuary ministry of Jesus. And he shared with them the news of the Sabbath. And the early records of the church indicate that where there was just a handful, I mean tens and twenties and just two or three hundred, after Joseph Bates' work, a couple of years later, there were hundreds and several thousands of people. He was a tremendous evangelist. The church grew. And uh, they needed a printing press. 
Adventists believe in publishing. <laughs> they didn't have radio and TV back then. They had that little magazine that today is now Adventist Review. <clears throat> and James White, pioneer that he was, entrepreneur that he was, had to hold the property for himself. And he complained in the, in the, Advent, in the review. He said, gentlemen, this isn't right. I shouldn't be owning the property that has come because people have donated funds for the church. It doesn't, it's not right. Well, to a group of people who've been kicked out of their churches, disfellowshipped, because they believed in the near, near, nearness of Jesus' second coming, that kind of talk about banding together and having an organization, well, that wasn't something that they wanted or, or believed was appropriate. But coming to the Bible, the more they studied, the more they see the, the body theology that is taught in the Bible. That Jesus says, on this rock, the reality that I am the Son of God, I will build my church. And he ordained those 12 elders, those 12 apostles to go out and to preach. And he built the church, and you take the the teachings of the Apostle Paul about how the church is to be gathered and the example of the evangelism that spread out in the early Christian church. And our forefathers were following that and as they studied, they said, we must have something. We must do something together that we cannot do on an individual basis. And so, moving quickly, we come to that day 150 years ago. Now let's go to the PowerPoint here. This is the first church. This is the Washington, New Hampshire church. If any of you ever have a chance to go to uh, Washington, New Hampshire and see this beautiful little church, there's just a small handful of Adventists who meet there every Sabbath, still meeting in that congregation. They came to um, Battle Creek, Michigan, and here was the meeting house. It was the second Advent meeting house. It was very similar to one that was in New Hampshire. And it was in this building that this group of individuals met that actually formed the nucleus. And here were the delegates. Now you can count them there. There was 14 of them, plus several leaders, who were the delegates who met and discussed. This was the first general conference constituency meeting. And uh, these individuals prayed and planned. Lord, how can we advance your work the most? How can we retain the individuality and the responsibility of the local congregation and yet uh, advance your work in the strongest way? They had a lot of different opinions. You take the top row there, the gentleman on the far right-hand side. A few weeks after he voted in favor of establishing the general conference, this man apostatized and became one of the leading proponents of spiritism in the United States. Tragic story of an individual who got attracted by the flame of spiritism and uh, became an apostate, opposed the church and its message. But as they met together, they formed this, excuse me, we'll back up one slide. Here's the group of individuals who were the leaders. James White is right in the, in the middle, and he was elected to be the general conference president. He said, no, this is not appropriate. My wife and I have been prominent leaders. We've been organizers. Yes, there's no question, but there's many others. And if this movement has as its first president, James White, they're going to say this is the White Church, not the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so he declined that responsibility. Later, he served in that capacity uh, uh, for a number of years. But these individuals had a vision. Now, I'd like us to go on. Here is the, a picture of the General Conference Constitution. It was a very short little document. You can put it on about a page and a half today. I don't expect you to read it, but I want you to, to catch a, a glimpse of it. And we're going to go to the next page here. And I want you to notice here... Point two, section five, point two, right in the center of your page, and I do hope that you can see this. It says, means for missionary operations. Means for missionary operations. When you look over the General Conference Constitution, it's a, the original document. This small group of individuals met together because of missionary work, evangelism. That was their focus. 
Yes, there was a time and a place for the regulation of pastors and where people were to be assigned to work and the like. But it was for the purpose of advancing God's work. 3,300 of them approximately in strength. Just a small little group of individuals, four or five of them. Three of them as executive officers. Well, we go on. And here we come to what was their message. Now, this is the picture of William Miller. And beside him is the Millerite chart. I want you to notice there the image of Daniel 2, the multi metal image of Daniel 2. Many of you have studied Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, the great stone that comes and smashes the earth, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And then you see Daniel chapter 7, the lion, the leopard, the bear, and then this dragon-like power and the horns that come up and then out of the horns, a little horn, etc. All of those prophecies. This was the prophetic basis of the Advent movement. Now what I want you to catch this evening, friends, is the a core message, the very core message of Adventism 150 years ago. 150 years ago, the call for our health work, as we know it today, hadn't been given. That message was given by a little lady by the name of Ellen White. <laughs> it kind of struck me the other day. I was reading some of the history of Adventism, and I, I love reading history. James White, they say, was about six feet tall. Well, I'm six feet tall, so James and I share the same height. Ellen White was five foot one and a half. If she stood on her toenails, it might be five foot two. That means that she was about this tall. She would have come up about to the top of my shoulder. A very little lady, a little person. I don't mean strong, robust, big boned or anything of that nature, but a very little person. She referred to herself as the weakest of the weak. And it was amazing that God chose that individual to remarkably guide and direct that fledgling and growing and prospering movement. But friends, here it was, 1863. Now think with me about what was happening then. 1863 in the United States, we were right in the middle of the Civil War. The Battle of Chickamauga, fought just a few miles from this location, had not yet been fought. It was fought in September of 1863. The Battle of Gettysburg happened about two months after the formation of the General Conference. This nation, the United States, was caught in a horrible, horrible civil war which was tearing north and south apart where black Americans were slaves. And our early pioneers, those individuals that you saw just a moment ago, were part of an underground railway organization helping black Americans, slaved, enslaved Americans, free, flee, I should say, to Canada and to freedom. They were very active in that social movement. And the United States economy was, well, it was a war-torn, civil war-based, in-debt economy. And there were thousands of young men and women who were killed on the battlefields. It was a horrible time in the history, perhaps the very bottom of the history of the United States in many respects. But it was at this time, at that time, that this little group of people, when the wind was blowing in the opposite direction, put their finger up and said, World, someday the United States will be the preeminent global world power. What? A nation caught in the Civil War? Tearing itself apart? In debt up to its eyes? Going to be a world power? ridiculous. And based on the prophecies, what else did we believe? We believed in the importance of the law of God, in the judgment, in the sanctuary, in the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. We believed at that point in time, we had accepted at that point in time, the teaching of the fact that the soul sleeps 
A person is asleep when they die. But friend, the message of clean and unclean foods had not yet permeated Adventism. Our health message had not yet permeated Adventism. Our educational message about universities and schools had not yet impacted and had not been given by God. There was a huge amount that we didn't understand. There was growth in the theology and understanding. There were no 28 fundamental beliefs. Oh, there she is today because we've come to a deeper, greater understanding. But at that core time, what was it? It was Jesus is our Savior. The Bible is the Word of God, and we need to follow that carefully. Jesus is coming again. The judgment is soon to occur. You're asleep when you die. And for people at that time when America was largely a, a Christian nation, to become a Seventh-day Adventist meant simply to begin keeping the Sabbath and believe that a person was asleep when they, were, when they died. That was about it. What happens? In that situation, Adventism again raises its finger and says, World, there is an antichrist power. And the power, that power is most clearly exemplified as the papacy. And the papacy is going to grow to become a worldwide power, a worldwide influence. And it will someday impose a mark of the beast where individuals acknowledge the authority of man rather than the authority of God. The eschatology was focused in on the beast, the mark of the beast, and the crisis at the close. Holding up its finger against the wind. What was the state of the papacy at that time, friend? What was the state of the papacy? Now, before I answer that question, I want to make a comment because there might be some person here this evening who is from the Roman Catholic Communion. Or you might be watching on internet or a broadcast of this, this program. And friend, I want to make very, very clear to you that if you're not a member of the Seventh Adventist Church and you're here tonight, <laughs> I'd like to shake your hands with both hands. I'd like to welcome you in the warmest, greatest way. We love to have you present and we're grateful and thankful and honored that you're here what I am saying tonight is not about Catholics about persons who are members of the Roman Catholic communion one cannot help but deeply appreciate and admire the thousands of individuals of that communion who give their life in compassionate service whether it's in teaching or medical work or whatever else I can only admire that in the deepest sense. What we're speaking about here is not people. We're not talking about the Catholic communions, the churches that where there might be a huge amount of good being done in, in those communities. But what we're talking about is the essential, essential theology and the perspective about the Word of God. And please... I want to make a very clear differentiation and a distinction, a separation between honest, deeply compassionate, Jesus-loving, Christ-loving people who are Catholics and the theology that that system represents. The Bible teaches that the very essence of sin is when an individual claims their right to themselves to determine what is right or wrong. As Chambers, Oswald Chambers, expresses it in his devotional book, he expresses it this way, the disposition of sin to turn a moral verdict against the dispos disposition of sin, specifically my claim to my right to myself. The human personality is born with an instinct to say, I am right, and I will determine what is right for me. Pastor Bob Lemon this past week was giving a devotional that I had the privilege of attending, and he shared an illustration. Time magazine, several years, a number of years ago, had on the front cover called The Me Generation, a picture of young people at that particular time. But just in the last several weeks, they have a new cover out. It's called The Me, Me, Me Generation. <laughs> Me, 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 a narcissistic 
concept that all the world revolves around me. And in our postmodern society, postmodern where people have said, no, what is right is what is the existential standard. That is, what is right for me is what I think is right. We find that the religious expression of that philosophy, of that disposition, is where individuals, corporately, with the best of motivation, say that they have the authority to stand above the authority of the Word of God. And that is, I say it kindly, I say it graciously, but that is the essence of the papal system. Where the church fathers, the bishops, the cardinals, down through the centuries, have come to interpretations that are different from the Bible, and rather than, agree, then, rather than bringing their opinions and their teachings in harmony with the Word of God, they hold above the Word of God. And in our society today, the same essential concept, the concept of humanism, the concept of what is right for me, the me, me, me generation, also takes the same position, and we stand above the Bible, and we stand in judgment of the plain teachings of the Bible. And early Adventists said, no, we believe in the Bible and the authority of the Bible. And what was brought to Adventism, particularly through the Christian connection denomination of which James White and others were a part of, was the belief that individuals should be invited to come to the study of the Bible and ask for themselves, Word of God, what do you say to me? And bring your life in harmony with the Word of God. Do you notice the difference? It is to let the Bible speak as the authority in my life and I bring my life into harmony with the Bible, not attempting to bring whatever I read here into harmony with my predispositions. You see, my friends, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And it's always faith. I don't care there's not one teaching of the Bible that we can completely and totally understand and, and, and really fully comprehend, we must at some point in time say, I have faith in the Word of God. And early Adventists took that position. Here they were, the Bible Sabbath, the law of God, the standard of the judgment is the law of God. God's law is to be eternally kept. That's why we keep the seventh day Sabbath. The Sabbath is a symbol of a relationship with God where I love Jesus Christ and I give my life totally and completely to Him in obedience. It's not the basis of my salvation. It's the fruit of that relationship. My mom and dad had a fruit orchard in British Columbia that I grew up on. We had many acres of apples. Why does an apple tree grow apples? Does it grow apples in order to prove that it is an apple tree? No, it grows apples because it is an apple tree. <laughs> and a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, keeps the law of God, keeps the teachings of Jesus Christ, not in order to prove or to earn his salvation, but because he is a Christian. What do you say, friends? And that was what early Adventism took. The Antichrist power would become universal, would have phenomenal influence. But it was at that time, my friend, in 1798 that the 1260-year prophecy had come to an end, the 1260-year prophecy of the book of Daniel and Revelation. The true church had been in hiding, and in this continent of this new land, God raised up an environment where there was freedom, and there was an opportunity for individuals to worship as they chose. And the church had been taken captive. Napoleon had sent his, uh, his uh, general Berthier down to Rome. They had captured the papal states. The Pope had been taken captive to Avignon in southern France. And the papacy was in disarray. 1863. 1863. It was just at this time that a individual that we would call a freedom fighter, Garibaldi, was leading a 
so to speak, revolution, but he swept all the way through Italy and he united all of the Italian states and he took all of the papal states captive again. And the Pope was allowed to stay in the Vatican, but the Vatican belonged to the Italian government. And he was only a technically a visitor. He was not a head of state. He was stripped of his power. The finances of the Catholic Church were in disarray. And if you read the history of the Pope at that time, there was a lot of other tragic things going on. And it was a, the, the church was highly discredited. A sad era of history. And at that time, when the system, the papacy was at its nadir, its lowest point, here's this group of 14, 18 Adventists in Battle Creek, Michigan. Folk, against the wind of popular opinion, this organization is someday going to be the premier Christian organization with the greatest influence and will lead the world to, a, to uh, the final crisis at the end of time. It was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. From a human perspective, what our early Advent pioneers accepted as their theology 150 years ago really was unreasonable. Time marches on, and <laughs> we come to a very significant epoch of the church in 1888. And many people get hung up on what is happening in 1888, but friends, you need to stop and think and look at the big picture. Uh, tonight, I want you to see the big picture of God working in, in this movement. Because I believe that as we look at the bigness of this movement, we see our church being more relevant today than we ever are you know, even 150 years ago. I believe more strongly in the Adventist church and its core theology and its essential teachings today than I ever did 150 years ago. We come down to 1888 and what had happened. 1844, 1888, there's 40 years difference. There's a generation that have gone by. And here are these early pioneers, many of them pastors, many of them ministers who had come to know and love Jesus Christ in a personal way. They were passionate believers in Jesus Christ. My story about William Miller, uh, about the Bible, everything was focused in on Jesus Christ. But to become a Seventh-day Adventist meant that you taught the Sabbath, the state of the dead. And they were starting to understand more about healthful living and a few other things at that point in time, too. So what happens? The church had become dry. Not because it didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Not because it didn't believe in salvation. But it had never been emphasized. And the work of evangelists had been so strongly to, to keep prominent the, the understanding that the Sabbath was part of the Ten Commandments and we should keep the law and they misinterpreted some key passages in the book of Galatians. And what happened out of that whole thing? God used two young men, James and uh, Jones and Wagner, along with Ellen White, to recapture, recapture the message of righteousness by faith that had been at the very core of the Advent Awakening by William Miller, friends. He recaptured that. And as the church caught that message from this little tiny lady and with these two other young evangelists as they were preaching and teaching, it caused some ripples, no question about it. But God led the church at that time. And what happened? Well, there was the missionary movement. Let's see here. Let's go to the next slide. And here is the, here is the message of prophecy. This is what was happening in New York uh, City. This is Pastor Simpson and his paper mache beasts. You see, they're all the beasts of Daniel and Revelation. We smile at the old technology. And we say, why did they have digital cameras back then, etc.? Well, that was, the, that was what the message of Adventism was. Jesus is coming again. And from that, 3,000, 3,400 members back in 1863, God has been guiding and directing this movement. Now, friend, is everything rosy perfect? <laughs> no. Have there been people made of mistakes along the way? Yes. Have there been prominent leaders who have apostatized? Yes. Were there some wrong systems of organization with our health work where the Dr. Kellogg took away the health institutions of the church? Yes. But through this little tiny lady, Ellen White, the message of healthful living, which has spawned the health food revolution. 
the breakfast food revolution. Kellogg's cornflakes, General Mills were all started out of the experience of Battle Creek. And it has gone on and swept to become a huge blessing. Oh yes, it's made its mistake. They use sugar pops now instead of proper things. We understand some of those things. But my point being, friend, that God blessed this church through the spirit of prophecy in a huge way. Our health work is growing and expanding. And through all of this, there was the message of evangelism. The core of Adventism 150 years ago was the message of our bringing our lives into harmony with the Bible, with the Word of God. And at the same time, at the same time, the second coming of Jesus Christ, preparing the world for his soon return. And what's happening? Our friends, God's using our health work in an outstanding way. Using it in an outstanding way. A story that is one that I can begin to talk about now, but it's a wonderful, marvelous story. This past week, I was in the Emirate of Dubai, in the Persian Gulf. I have flown through Dubai a number of times, but I've never stopped to stay there. And we had our Hope Channel television channel managers meeting. Maybe you've heard, but we actually operate 14 full-time hope channels and to keep them together we meet once a year for our channel managers meeting at the same time the internet has become extremely important for communicating the gospel and so we had a global Adventist internet network and we bring the leaders of technology from around the church together and so we said look let's bring the two groups together because we want to integrate and converge as strongly as possible because it's so complementary. Well, friends, you'll read about it in the Adventist Review, but last, this past week, a week ago on Tuesday, representatives from Loma Linda University, our General Conference Health Department, met with the University of Dubai Medical Schools and established a formal agreement where faculty members from Loma Linda will be able to come, not only be able to come, they will be taught, invited and paid to come and to teach in the university there because there is a recognized need on the part of this area of the world for the Adventist health message. What do you say, friends? A huge development. They expect very soon to have six, eight, ten. Loma Linda faculty members in the university teaching the public health department. Wow, what a huge development. And you know, friends, as I look about what happened in the Adventist movement, why have we exploded as a movement? Think with me. HMS Richards started in radio, the voice of prophecy. Then came Faith for Today. Then came It Is Written with George Vanderman and the ministries that came from those things. Why do we have those ministries? Well, we have it because of evangelism, because there's burning in the heart of us as Adventists the, the need and the, the message of Jesus Christ to take the message to the world. And so what has happened with the technology? Well, you can appreciate that I have a perspective on the television ministry that maybe some of you don't have the privilege of seeing, but I'm amazed. I'm amazed. Back in 1995 when we had the first event here in Chattanooga, I remember standing there in the Chattanooga Convention Center and I stood at the point right at the stage and there to the right was the congregation. Maybe many of you were there. Two, three thousand people and listening to Pastor Finney who was preaching on the stage, preaching his heart out a wonderful gospel message. And behind him, there was the production truck. And there was this little 12-inch monitor. And what Pastor Finley was doing there was being captured by the cameras going through the production truck. The graphics and all the other things were added, going up 24,000 miles to this satellite, back down, and onto that television all within about a second and a half. I couldn't believe my eyes. And I said to myself, Lord, what a wonderful thing it would be if we could have that happen around the world. Do you know, my friends, tonight nearly 3 million people in the World Adventist Church 
can count that a satellite net event has played a very key role in their conversion experience. Amen. And it started here in Chattanooga. Amen. And we sponsor these events every year around the world. It's amazing to me what has happened. We had a, an event this past September. Pastor Raguri is the president of the East Central Africa Division. It's headquartered in Nairobi, Kenya. The East Central Africa Division and takes in the fields of, of Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Uganda, uh, and the Congo, uh, going all the way down through, and it takes in Malawi as well, Tanzania. It's a big area, huge area of Africa. They went to work. They planned more than a year in advance. They had materials given to the churches. And the net event was to be the culmination of this event. Friends, <laughs> I could take till midnight tonight, and I'm not going to do that, to tell you all the problems we had. And I've discovered one thing. When we have a lot of problems, God's going to do something extremely unusual in touching some person's lives. And it was just, just today. No, excuse me, yesterday. Yesterday, I got the report from this event. And they gave me a union-by-union union presentation. And many of these people who have been recently baptized, they insist that they take 6 to 12 months in baptismal classes before they're baptized. And do you know how many people have been baptized from that major event? More than 236,000 people. 236,000. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> to be honest with you, when I was in the middle of trying to solve all the problems, I thought there might be 10 people coming. <laughs> but it was incredible what has happened. Why is the Holy Spirit doing something like that? Why? Friends, it's not Brad Thorpe, it's not Hope Channel, it's not AWR, it's all of these things. Why is God putting all of this together at this time in Earth's history? I was in Dubai last week as I was ch telling you about. And we had a we've had a situation developed for Africa which is really a shock to us. We've never had something like this happen before. We have two channels broadcast to Africa. English, a lot of the programming that you see uh, on Hope Channel, but a lot that you don't see because it comes from Africa. It's oriented for an African audience, which is fine. That's why we have these different channels. We also have the Portuguese channel from Brazil. The signal path goes from Brazil to Europe, it's picked up and sent to the satellite and sent all over sub-Sahara Africa. We've had a contract with this company for nearly five years. The contract ended in, in March, and we were extending it, and the company offered us a three-month extension. Well, we were making some technical changes and the like, and we needed that three-month extension, no problem. They sent us the contract, we, uh, the offer. We had the, the uh, uh, Pastor uh, Ratsara, president of the division, signed it. We sent it to them, thought everything was fine. And last Tuesday, I get a message. Brad, the company says you either extend the contract by three years or they're stopping broadcast next Tuesday. That is yesterday. Oh, yay, yay. All of a sudden, we're going to lose all of our Portuguese broadcast for Angola and Mozambique. Well, this is a, a tragedy. And we did everything we could and finally said, well, okay, there's going to be an 11-day break because we're going to start the new service in January 1. So I announced this to the division, regrettably, and explained what was happening. I don't have the time to talk about it now. And the, a desperate message came back. Pastor Brad, we just are beginning a net evangelism event in Angola. It's called Esperanza Angola, Portuguese Hope for Angola. We've been preparing for this for a year. We've prepared programs in Brazil. We've sent out thousands of invitations, hundreds of thousands of Bibles, all in preparation. And this is the thing that blew me away. They said we have 89,000 documented locations where the programs are happening every week. And we need the broadcast to support 89,000 locations. Friends, do you realize what that means? 89,000? Even if there's only 10 people or 50 people in each of those locations, you can do the math. We're pushing more than a million people attending every, every one of these programs. My heart sank within me. We took it back and said, Lord, please help us to find a solution. 
And I'm thankful tonight to tell you that God answered our prayers. We found a solution. We've put it onto a different channel. And I invite you to pray with me tonight that God will help all 89,000 of those locations change their parameters so that they can receive the program. But my friends, the point that I want you to catch is not so much the 89,000, is what's happening in Adventist World Radio. More than 100,000, no, excuse me, more than 100 languages of the world that are, are not common to North America are available on their podcast. Do you realize that every day, every day, 365 days of the year, more than a half million people in the country of China alone download an AWR podcast. Incredible what's happening. Now friends, when I see those things, and I, and I see here that how God is expanding and developing this. We have 14 channels now. Right now we're working to develop the 15th for indigenous languages in Africa. Hope Channel Philippines opens in, in August. Hope Channel Indonesia has begun the largest Muslim nation in the world. We're beginning a full-time channel for that. There's uh, developments for a French language channel, etc. It keeps expanding and growing. It's far bigger than anything I ever envisioned. <laughs> I have to laugh to myself and be a little bit embarrassed. You know, Pastor Wright, sometimes we as leaders kind of get ourselves rebuked for thinking too small. And uh, I remember Randy Shornstein at the Media Center in California said back in 2002, before we were starting the Hope Channel, he said, Brad, how many channels do you think we conceivably will need? One, two? And I said, well, Randy, I don't know. I thought about it for several days, prayed about it. And I said, well, I think we'll need two channels. Two channels. <laughs> now we're running seven channels out of that location. God opened those things up. And my question to you, my friends, is not so much what's happening in AWR or in, our, in the internet podcast where there's millions of minutes being downloaded around the world, etc., etc. My point is when we stand back and look at the big picture and we see what has God done for 150 years, friend, what is the state of the, of the papal organization around the world today? What is it? What is it? You go do the research. The single most influential religious organization in the world today is that of the Roman system. And it has grown and expanded. Yes, there's been a demographic shift. There's less Roman Catholics in Europe than there was 150 years ago. But when we look at what's happened in Latin America, in North America, in Africa, my friend, there is no organization that is bigger than that. What about the United States that was caught in civil war 150 years ago that was weak financially at that point in time? What is it today? Oh, yes, we got trillions of dollars of debt, but it is the only world superpower. And friend, I say to you tonight that the message of Adventism has more relevance, has more relevance today than we did 150 years ago. Instead of our finger being up against the wind, what we're saying today is in harmony with the wind. And my friends, tonight, when you and I Think about the birthday, the 150th birthday of the Seventh Adventist Church. Oh, let's not get the birthday celebrations wrong. I praise the Lord for our institutions. But institutions are only a means to an end. The technology is only a means to an end. And God's purpose, God's end, is that every individual everywhere in this world will see and hear a presentation of his end time three angels message in the most attractive format that they possibly can and that their hearts will respond to the Holy Spirit and be prepared for Jesus' second coming. That's why we exist. I'm reminded of this text in, in Romans chapter 13 and I'm going to come to a close here now as we come to this point. But please catch it with me. Romans chapter 13. Take your Bibles, please. I will come again was the promise of Jesus. The date of Jesus' second coming, the time of his coming, my friend, is the sovereign secret of our eternal God. In When the clock struck the right hour, Jesus came the first time. And when the clock strikes the right hour, in God's great cosmic 
plan, not only involving this world, but for factors that we don't see and don't under fully understand in the universe, when that time comes, it is the time that Jesus will come. But in the meantime, in the meantime, your responsibility, my responsibility, our corporate family responsibility is that we will be bold and zealous and do everything we can to, to warn every person about Jesus' second coming. Amen. Romans 13, verse 11. And do this. Chapter 13, verse 11. And do this, knowing the time that it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, nor in licentiousness and lewdness, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. My friends, our world church voted. It appeals to every person for an experience of revival and reformation. It is appealing for urban evangelism. It is appealing for us to reach out in the greatest way possible. I say to you tonight, because many of you are church elders, church deacons, Sabbath school superintendents, youth leaders. My friend, what are you doing? Not, and please don't misunderstand me. Our, our work, our mission is not only to make the church a warm, loving, accepting place. It is to call men and women to confront Jesus Christ and to understand the claims that he has on every soul. That's what we are here for. And my brothers and sisters, we need to stop and evaluate it. We say 150 years have gone by. What are we doing? What have we done to lead our community to know that Jesus is coming soon? Who have we led to gently carefully, kindly, compassionately meet the claims of Jesus Christ in their heart and life. That's what the church has called for, my friends. When I look at 150 years, well, in one sense, I weep because if Jesus had come back then, there wouldn't have been World War II and all the other horrible tragedies that we could recite. But friend, it is the most exciting time in the world to live. It's fantastic to live in this time of Earth's history. Whatever else have we had this kind of a development in the world history with the technology and the transportation and all the other things that go along with it. It is an incredible time for us to live. But friends, let us never get caught up in the deceitfulness of riches or in the snares of this world that Jesus warned us about and lose sight of the reason why we are called to proclaim the nearness of his soon return. And tonight, friend, I want to speak to your heart. I want to ask you the question. Because I preach to this man. Are my priorities right? Am I really putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable? Or the emphasis on the right syllable? <laughs> You follow me? How are we living? How is this body temple? We can change. The message of the gospel is that we're not bound by the inclinations that may be inherent or cultivated in our sinful natures. What about our families? Are we living authentic, genuine Christian lives? Do people say, does my son, my daughter say, yo, mom and dad, yeah, they got their weaknesses and their feelings, but they're really authentically Christians. My friends, Jesus speaks to our hearts, and he, in the words of John in Revelation chapter 3, he's knocking at the heart door, and he's saying, <clears throat> will you let me in? Will you keep priorities straight? And my invitation to us tonight, friend, is that if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I invite you to do so tonight. I invite you to do so. There might be some person here, you've heard about the Adventist church, you've attended church, you've come to camp meeting, and you say, well, I don't know, should I or shouldn't I? Friend, it's the best thing in the world. Best thing in the world to be part of God's family. Tomorrow night I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> the topic of but God message from Ephesians but God 
God can change your life, my friend. You don't need to be bound by the slavery of whatever habit or inclination that you may have. You can find freedom in Jesus Christ. And tonight I rejoice in the fact that my sins are forgiven and I am guiltless by the righteousness of Jesus Christ before the throne of God. You can have that experience too. Tonight, my friend, I encourage you as a leader, as a business person, whatever profession you may have, teacher, professor, whatever the case may be, friend, is Jesus coming first in your life, your ministry, your profession, your business, whatever? What a difference. Christ is calling for us to make things real in our lives. And tonight, I am glad, I thank heaven for God's willingness to work with this corporate group of people. Instead of 3,300 or what are thereabouts, 150 years, 150 years ago, there are 17 plus million Seventh-day Adventists around the world, more than 35 million every Sabbath who attend a church service sponsored by the World Adventist Church. A world family, my friend. And there are two movements developing, and you and I, by God's grace, can be part of God's truth church. And so tonight I invite you to come closer to Jesus because his message is more relevant today than it ever has been. Amen. Amen. Amen.